Hi, today's lab is going to be a very simple demonstration of the use of the caliper. Um, they were common in the past known as uh, vernier calipers and uh, I have one here, one of the original types that uh, you know has this analog scale that is uh, quite interesting to try to read. Once you get used to it it's not too bad but you know, it's a whole nother deal having to explain how to read one of these things and then use them properly. So that's the old fashioned vernier caliper. Um, thankfully, it's modern day technology uh, has given us a much simpler uh, um, method with the digital caliper. You just turn that and you see the uh, scales come up right there. And uh, that is much easier of course are more convenient than having to read the analog scale and when I look at it uh, it's actually you know to the uh, nearest point oh one millimeter now keep in mind this is a millimeter scale so that's important when you're doing conversions and this old-fashioned one just says plus or minus point oh two millimeters so uh, you know not much difference in terms of precision but you know much more convenient to just read it off the digital scale here but keep in mind also that that last decimal place the 01 is estimated it's estimated for us by the uh, electronics in the caliber but um, uh, it's still just an estimate so if someone else were to use a different caliper they might get plus or minus 0.01 difference at least um, assuming this thing is uh, calibrated all the way to the last decimal place. So that's uh, the basic idea and that's one of the main things that we're doing in this video. The other main thing that, we're, that I'm going to do in this video is um, density of course. We're going to use a caliber and we're going to make some simple measurements with it and uh, calculate volume and then uh, measure mass of course and get density of a metal. Right. So I have here three metal balls that uh, are the type that uh, you guys would have been working with had I had enough of them to send out to everyone in the uh, mail, but I only had like 14 of these and I needed 16 or something like that. And so um, I didn't send these out. Um, these are drilled metal uh, balls that will also be used for the um, lab whenever we do some uh, ballistics, uh, you know, projectile motions. Now, all I'm going to do is use one of these balls for the uh, for the density experiment, and I know that this one is a nice lightweight aluminum ball. And you can look at this one and see the rust on it, and that's a pretty sure sign uh, that that is just a nice iron ball or steel is iron with a little bit of carbon practically pretty pure iron and this one over here though is uh, not certain you see it's got a different color a yellowish uh, gold kind of color to it and it might be zinc or brass um, not sure so I'm going to use this metal ball and try to figure out the density of this one as a true unknown using the methods for this experiment. Alright, so I'm going to be doing um, you know, the procedures given in this uh, handout right here or this file that's on Canvas and what I expect you guys to do is of course like I got here, watch the video um, that's going to be posted and or it is posted now that you're watching it of course. So um, as I go through the procedure here, uh, I'm not going to write down the measurements that I make. You're going to have to write them down uh, from what you see in the video. And then, of course, do your calculations and answer the questions uh, at the end of the lab, uh, etc. Now, I'm not going to do everything in here. Um, and, of course, so you guys won't be expected to do everything. What I'm uh, not going to do is the ruler. Uh, ball diameter and the but I'm going to do the caliber of course and of course I don't need to do the ruler because you guys are doing this uh, or similar experiment at home using uh, your measurements
measuring tape and the um, cylinder, the metal cylinder. So, uh, nevertheless, the first step here is um, measure the diameter of a metal ball, but not at the hole. So, if this is the ball, um, you know, we don't want to measure it right at the hole because it's kind of flat on, uh, on the hole. And it doesn't have the full circular or uh, spherical uh, uh, shape to it right at the hole. And so we want to go anywhere else besides at the hole to measure the uh, diameter of the ball. And, of course, we're going to use a caliber here. You see when it's closed all the way, you hit the zero button and it's zero. Of course, if it's not zeroed. But when you open it up, it you know, close it all the way and see it's zeroed. If it wasn't reading zero, then I could hit the zero button when I know it's closed all the way and there's nothing blocking the caliber from sh from uh, closing. Now, just as a demonstration of its sensitivity, let me uh, put the, uh, the lab sheet, one single piece of paper inside of it and close it up and see how thick a single sheet of paper is on the millimeter scale. Okay, now I close it up tight. 0 0.10 millimeters for a sheet of paper. That's interesting. I'm sorry, I said, yeah, I said 0 0.10, that's correct. So let's try a second sheet of paper, see if it's uniform thickness on the paper. And close it up. Now I'm not trying to smush it. Just close it up gently and it's 0 0.09. Pretty close. Let's try a different position on the same sheet of paper. And uh, close it up. 0 0.09. So that's pretty consistent on that paper. So that's just a little extra as you can see. A single sheet of paper is 0 0.09. Now again, this thing can uh, from the you know digital readout here, it can go ten times more precise, or you could say ten times thinner than a sheet of paper is how sensitive this caliber is on the length measurements. That's pretty impressive. Um, so on to the first measurement for the experiment. Um, we have the ball. I'm just going to make sure the ball can slide uh, through the caliber, just barely slide through it. There we go, it's barely sliding through it, so that's pretty good measurement. See a little catch when it's going through the caliber, I mean it's just barely. So that's a pretty good measurement of the diameter of the ball right there. Okay, so of course you can read it from the scale. I can do this. Oh, man. Try to get exactly at the thickest part of the sphere. 25.25. And again, that's millimeter scale. On your uh, lab sheet, it says centimeters. So you're going to have to convert that to centimeters. How do you do that? Well, there's 10 millimeters per centimeter. So all you got to do is divide this number by 10. And of course, that will give you the centimeters. So. Uh, all right, that's pretty straightforward. Let's see what's next. Okay, so the next thing is to get this unit in inches, or get this measurement in inches. Now, I could just keep it at 25.25, which is fine, uh, I guess, and then uh, just hit the uh, button here to convert it to inches, but that's just doing a conversion. And that's like saying, I know what the conversion factor is, is 2.54 centimeters per inch, or you could say 0.254, I'm sorry, not point, 25.4 uh, millimeters per inch, 25.4 millimeters per inch. So this is almost, you know, uh, an inch is what it looks like. Um, but it's not quite, and nevertheless, um, if I just hit the conversion button, that's taking a little bit of the point of the experiment out. The point of the experiment is to do two independent measurements of the same item on two different scales and then calculate your own conversion factor. So I'm going to hit the conversion button. Well, actually, I'm going to close it up. So this is going to be a completely independent trial. Hit the conversion. Go to the inch scale. And you see it gets all the way to the... Wow, that's four decimal places on the inches because the inch is, of course, a bigger unit of length. So 
that is the uh, ten thousandth of an inch. That's the maximum precision on there. And so here we go, opening it up. So I'm going to measure the diameter the exact same way, but this is an independent measurement now. I didn't just convert 25.25 to inches using the conversion factor. On you guys' lab, when you measure in inches and centimeters uh, for your metal cylinder at home, make sure you do this similar idea. You completely independently remeasure the same object. That way, you're getting a true test of your ability to be consistent, self-consistent, precise, and hopefully accurate. Okay, so that looks like it right there. Now, when you have a measurement locked in place on the caliber, um, you can tighten this little screw right here, and it will hold it uh, there strongly so the caliber doesn't actually accidentally get bumped. And so I got 0.9945 inches. Okay, so write that one down. All right, I wrote those two numbers down up here. And I said I wasn't going to, you know, write down this stuff for, for you, but it's that's how simple digital scales are. You just read it off the scale so there's nothing. Whenever we get to the uh, analog scale, like on the um, graduated cylinder here, you're going to have to read that yourself. And... Uh, I'm not going to tell you what my reading is. You're going to read it yourself. Okay. Anyhow, what's the next part down here is uh, similar to what you're going to do at home with the, again, with the um, metal cylinder. But here with these uh, two numbers here, you just calculate your own conversion factor and compare it to the known exact value. And uh, notice that we have four significant figures up here for each of these. So when we divide them to get our own conversion factor, we can keep four significant figures on either. If this conversion factor is given to four significant figures, it would be 2.540. I mean, because this is exact. So we could have however many zeros of precision out here as you want. Okay, that's the defined conversion. So we compare this result with this one exactly and see what percent error. I expect the percent error to be very small because it's not too difficult to be self-consistent with the caliper. Okay, what's next on here? I got um, the mass of the ball. I got two different scales that we're going to use. A low precision mass and a high precision mass. Now, of course, ignore this in parentheses. That was before I had to change the procedure for you guys to use this, the metal cylinder and just watch the uh, metal ball on the video here. But um, I'm going to have a low precision mass scale. I got that one right here. Uh, let me turn that on. And let's see what the mass of the ball is on this scale. All right, ounces goes to uh, OZT, whatever that stands for, DWT, CT, GN, G, grams. Okay, that's the scale we want, grams. Now, um, it's just one decimal place of precision, so you guys' home scale gets more precise than this one. You see, this one is now reading the grams is 66.5. That's three significant figures, so that still ain't too shabby if you can get at least three significant figures. So write that one down on the low precision mass, and then I'm going to go to the other uh, lab to show you guys the analytical scale. To measure it at high precision. Okay, so excuse the messy lab behind me, but this is the analytical scale right here. Of course, this is a thousand dollar scale minimum you can get them fancy to be you know, several thousand dollars but um this guy goes to the ten thousandth of a gram that's pretty precise. actually i'm going to use this one because it's already turned on and doesn't have to self calibrate the other one has a self calibration that automatically clicks in whenever you turn it on and it takes some extra time so let's skip that anyhow you look at this and notice the spirit level right here that's a very important part of these analytical balances. They are so sensitive that if they are the least bit unlevel, then it will throw your decimal places off somewhere up there. And you can see that the bubble is right in the middle, bullseye, and so it is level and ready to be used. Okay, so here is the middle ball of unknown type. Put it in there. Close it up. 
that's protecting it from any kind of air currents and it's nice stable reading but generally you have to wait until you see that little squiggly line right there meaning that it's stabilized adequately so write that down that's the super precise mass of the metal ball okay now notice something about these two different mass measurements on two different instruments say do these two measurements agree with each other what do you think yeah well I think they do because of course 66.5 that last decimal place is estimated by the electronics of the instrument and so it's understood or should be understood to be 66.5 plus or minus 0.1 unless you read something in the uh, you know manual for the scale that you know it's different and you assume it's plus or minus that 0.1 so it could be 0.4 so this down here for the analytical scale says 66.46 and notice if you round this one off then it will go up to 66.5 and perfectly agree so these two numbers agree perfectly within significant figures of their precision levels so that's good all right so the next parts of the lab procedure here is just to start filling in the table basically and of course is written in detail in the procedures so uh, of course we're not doing the ruler measurements for this video so we can just cross this this column out um, but we need the length of the hole the whole diameter and the volume of the hole which we can calculate and the volume of the metal which is going to be calculated of course we also have the graduated cylinder column which we are going to do in this experiment for some contrast uh, on precision compared to the caliber measurements now how do you get the, the length of the hole that's in the metal ball well that's going to be you know from one end to the other where we avoided measuring the diameter on top of the hole we're now going to measure uh, that length right there on purpose so let's do that with the caliber it should be easier on that because it's flat where the hole is so it's not quite as uncertain here uh, let's see Oops, I gotta tighten up here I gotta loosen it again so I can move it okay now remember 25.25 was the uh, measurement for the uh, diameter and let's see the hole if you know we can assume is going to be uh, less than that because a little bit of the ball is cut off I'm still on the inches scale here so I don't need the inches scale anymore I'm just doing that for a simple demonstration that's fraction 61 64th okay and there we go back on the millimeter scale so it is slightly less than the diameter of the ball which is what we expected so there you go that's the millimeters write that down for the length of the hole now if I move it a little bit oh it's got a little variation and I'm uh, no shouldn't have much any variation just when I try to slide it out uh, it's got one side is maybe a little bit less flat than the other side on that hole so that seems pretty good right there though let's take that one all right write that down 24.26 is what I'm writing down okay and next we need the whole diameter now this is where the caliber comes in very handy with being able to measure the inside diameter of objects like small pipes and tubes and, and drilled holes in a ball and that's where we use the I call it the inverted clamp on the back of the caliper so you see how it forms a little scissors like that where you can put it right in down in the hole and you see how it open it goes down in there and it gets the flat edge here and here right up on the side of the hole press against the side of the hole so that you get the inside diameter of that hole so I'm just uh, opening it up all the way inside the hole and it's pressing two flat edges against the inside of the metal and it reads that value for the inside diameter of the hole and we need that in order to calculate the volume of that hole so 4.68 okay 
Okay, now I got to um, correct something here on my sheets. Um, maybe some of you already uh, realize this. Uh, I wrote centimeters up there because you need the scale, and uh, I didn't actually convert my numbers to centimeters. So my numbers in centimeters is just going to be divided by 10, and so that's going to be 2.525 centimeters and 2.426 centimeters for the length of the hole. And then the diameter was 4.68, which is going to be 0 0.468 centimeters for the diameter of the hole in the middle ball. Okay, now we got volume of the hole from uh, the vernier caliper measurement. Well, what are you going to use to calculate the volume of the hole? Well, all you do is use, of course, the formula for the volume of a cylinder, which is given right back here in the procedures, and it's also given, of course, on your home lab procedures. Um, so, that's the volume of a sphere, which we will use in a minute, or which you can use in a minute, and, you know, the volume of the cylinder is, well, one of these pages, I know it's in here somewhere. There it is, right there, the volume of a cylinder. Of course, it's a very easy formula, pi r squared times the length. We just measured the length and the diameter. From the diameter, you can get the radius, right? Of course, half of the diameter is the radius. Plug it into that, and you get the volume of the cylinder. So I'll leave you guys to calculate that on your own. All I'm going to do is make the rest of the measurements for this video. So once you calculate the volume of the hole, then you can calculate the volume of the metal um, using the uh, formula for the volume of a sphere. Because we have the diameter of the ball, and if we say it's a perfect sphere, then we can calculate the volume of that sphere with nothing but this uh, diameter. And then uh, you say, well, it's not a perfect sphere. It's got a hole drilled through it. So you take the volume of the perfect sphere and subtract the volume of the hole, and that's what you put for the volume of your metal right there. Um, and of course, uh, what I'm going to do now, though, is uh, measure the volume of the metal using the water immersion technique with a graduated cylinder. So this is a handy method for odd-shaped objects. I mean, this may not be a very oddly shaped object, but it is somewhat. And so we're going to immerse it in water to get the volume of the metal in the graduated cylinder. Okay, first I'm going to pour in some water, and it doesn't have to be an exact amount, but we need to measure the exact amount. We don't have to use a certain amount, just enough to completely immerse the ball, and that's enough to completely immerse the ball. Um, so I could use that amount. I think the procedure says to fill it up to around 50 milliliters, but that's very arbitrary. I don't know for sure. I know in you guys' the procedure says that. So I'm going to fill it up near 50 milliliters, but again, it's not exact. But we do need to measure it exactly in order to get the maximum precision. So um, I have a spirit level here, and the best thing to do is to put this on a flat surface and make sure it's level, and then do the reading. So I'm going okay, to do so that. Okay, so that table in the lab was not perfectly level. And so this is actually my spirit level sitting directly on top of the graduated cylinder. So we can say, hey, the graduated cylinder is perfectly level now. So this technically ensures the highest precision possible on the reading. So let's see what it is. Okay. All right. Perfectly level with the high level, as you would say, with the uh, m nice white background. You can see the bottom of that meniscus, the dark line, and that's what you would read for the volume. Okay, that's it. Perfect. Read that and write it down. Now for the scary part of the experiment. I got to roll this metal, this very dense, heavy piece of metal into this highly breakable glass cylinder without spilling any of the water. 
So I'm going to turn it nearly horizontal so it will roll very slowly. Hopefully it won't do nothing harmful. Ooh. Okay, hit the water and slow it down nicely. And none of it splashed out. So we're good. Got the metal ball down in there. And now we just got to go back in the lab and set it down on the nice level laptop bench. Alright, it's nice and level on the laptop bench here. Put the ball down in there. Oops, I don't have my nice white background for you to see the meniscus clearly. Alright, I got it now. See the scale pretty well. And the bottom of the meniscus there. And you make the reading. Okay, now all that's left for you to do is to calculate the uh, total volume of the ball caliber. That's treating it as a perfect sphere, not accounting for the hole that's in the ball. And then on the next page, you're going to do this as well. You got to get the uh, density calculated two different ways using the uh, less precise mass value and the more precise mass value and then um, the, uh, the least precise density is going to use of course the least precise volume and the least precise mass and the most precise density is going to use the most precise volume and the most precise mass and you're going to calculate both of those right here and then um, omit number 13. How about that? No, that's not a good thing. So omit number 13. Okay. And then you're going to come down here and look at a table of data to find known densities of metals and compare with uh, what we're getting, what you're getting. You have too much trouble doing these last three problems. Okay. Well, I'm excited to get the. Um, Two different volume methods uh, compared for that uh, metal and of course calculate the density and help uh, figure out exactly what kind of metal that ball is. Um, I'm guessing it's either zinc or brass but uh, hopefully the density will tell us for sure and that's about all there is for this video. I hope it wasn't too terribly boring for you. Um, this is the first short one of the term, and there will be probably four more to come this term. And they will be uh, more in-depth, more interesting, I hope, uh, and a little bit more elaborate. So we shall see.